tell me about who you are. Well, um, I'm a small town girl from, woman from Queens, born in Queens. Ah. Born in Brooklyn, sorry, raised in Queens. Mm -hmm. Lived uh, many years in Queens and then moved to Florida with the family. And mm -hmm. uh, when I got married in Florida, my uh, husband always wanted to work abroad. Mm -hmm. And uh, he spoke a beautiful French from a uh, university. And the only thing he was able to get was a job in Hong Kong. And trust me, you don't need French there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, we went off to Hong Kong. And uh, it was very overwhelming the first year. True, for the first time in my life, I could see people eye to eye <laughs> <laughs> for my height. Uh, but this sea of dark heads and uh, it was quite overwhelming because you do walk single file with your arms oh, yeah. tucked in and this was in 1976 okay what about the same when time? I first went abroad I've never been anywhere before mm -hmm. other than certain parts of the United States and um, who gets that kind of an opportunity at first it was overwhelming after the first year then you start to acclimate. Mm -hmm. we, he had a penthouse apartment on the 26th floor, which was very interesting because it was illegal. Mm. And so after you got to the 24th floor, you'd have to walk the rest of the way up. And I remember uh, one time, within the first week I was there, I, to hang the laundry was on another rooftop above us, and there I am, fear of heights as well. Mm -hmm. And I'm climbing up the spiral staircase, <laughs> hanging on with one arm and holding the laundry with the other arm. <clears throat> and I said, well, if I fall, another expat <laughs> splat on the sidewalk, that's the way it goes, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it, uh, I had locked myself Is out. On the Kowloon? Or I was on the, uh, wait a minute, I was on Hong Kong side. Okay. We were in a... Uh, a community called Pama Day. Pama Day is Happy Valley, where okay. the original race is. course was. Yeah. Because the Hong Kong Chinese, there isn't very much to do there, but they do like their racing. Mm -hmm. Oh, do they love it. <laughs> and from the rooftops from where we were living, you could see everything. So okay. there we'd be sitting with the binoculars or whatever, or sometimes my husband's friends would come over, and because I was so little, they wanted to go downstairs and get one of those um, remote control uh, helicopters and they thought they'd stick me in it to get me down to the bedding area with little eye scoff and goggles on and I have fear of height <laughs> that was not one of my favorites but um, and then within the first few months I was in Hong Kong I experienced a number 10 typhoon which is very overwhelming but it's very interesting too because the buildings are made to sway and we were in this penthouse apartment which was ceiling to floor, wall to wall windows. Mm -hmm. And you don't really want to be in something like that on the 26th floor with a number 10 no. typhoon. Because one crack, you're sucked out like an airplane. <clears throat> so there we are in our little two by two nothing bathroom. And everything is swinging, your neck, your neck pieces, <laughs> your everything. But it was a very interesting um, uh, experience. And I ended up being in Hong Kong for about 13 years. Okay. And uh, what was very nice That's was... A long time. Yes, it was. It was from 1978 to 1991. <coughs> okay. And um, I was very fortunate. True, I had a work permit because of the grace of my husband mm -hmm. in those days. I don't know if things have changed. Who, who did he work for? He worked for GT Sylvania out of Connecticut. Oh, okay. And they took him over there. Mm -hmm. And you have to go with a company. You can't just walk in right. and start looking for a job. Otherwise, you'd still have to leave the country. Mm -hmm. But um, he didn't stay with them for the duration of time, but he did start yeah. with them. Mm -hmm. And I was fortunate enough that... Hong Kong was the only Asian country at that time mm -hmm. that allowed you to have a business without a nationalist of the country. So I was able to do my own business, which I did. What did you do? I do, did, uh, I was the sculptured nail maven. 
They didn't okay. know anything about sculptured nails in Hong Kong oh, at that time. Like <laughs> well, yeah, I would have thought the same, except being the majority of expats that were there, which were British and Australian, mm. and Americans were a rarity, and mm -hmm. you watched how you spoke. Yes. Because it was, it's the inflection when you're speaking that they know right away whether, you, yeah. I mean, the British and the Australians uh, definitely knew who mm -hmm. you were. And it, you were almost like taboo, taboo. But anyway, um, the majority, because they were British and Australian, it wasn't being done in their country as of yet. Mm -hmm. So they had no idea what I was doing. Yeah. So um, it took me, and you couldn't put an ad in the paper saying sculptured nail operator wanted. They didn't know <laughs> what it was. So um, I started, I, I rented space in a hair salon. Mm -hmm. And I would sit from 9 in the morning till 9 at night trying to get a customer. <laughs> mm. Wow. And it was very difficult in the beginning because um, the Chinese are very shy people. Mm -hmm. They don't like odors, they don't like being touched. I mean, even Elizabeth Arden, who was also sharing the hair salon, mm -hmm. was having a hard time getting people in for massage or mm -hmm. facials. Uh, it, it was a, a, a certain concept that the Asian would yeah. really have. Yeah. And with my nails, they thought that it was, you would even get, huh? well, they <laughs> thought you take your nails off uh, and put uh, these uh, on, or do you get cancer from these nails? And mm -hmm. no, that that's not quite. The, 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 yeah. the, the, uh, the purpose of the business. <laughs> the process. Yeah, the process. Let, let me back up just a little bit. I'm going to get some kind of key information, sure. and then we'll go back to the discussions and the questions, if that's okay. So uh, you're a U.S. citizen? Yes, I am. Living here in Mexico Japan, now. Mexico. I live in Mexico, and ironically, it was, um, I was living in Florida with my mom, taking mm -hmm. care of her. And the last drive-by shooting in the area, and the last woman who was raped in the mall at noon, my mom said, we're out of here. You were in my, Miami area? We were in the Fort Lauderdale area. Okay. We started in Miami in 1969. Mm -hmm. We had been there for many, many years. Um, my mom had been coming to Mexico for a little over 40 years on and off. <laughs> and when she brought me here, in uh, 91 or 92 for the first time. Chapala and Ayihik, as you see it right now, <laughs> was nothing, yeah. absolutely nothing. They literally did roll the sidewalks up at about seven o'clock in the evening. It was horse and buggy from Ayihik to Chapala. Mm -hmm. And I didn't mind the isolation. The thing that worried me when I first came with my mom was what am I supposed to do at nine o'clock in the at yeah. seven o'clock in the evening and everything's rolled up and I'm taking care of you. I it was too isol I, it you was were too single you were single in or? Yes. And it was a very it took her almost three years to get me to come here. Uh -huh. Now I am totally grateful <laughs> uh, to let her know that I'm very pleased that she got me here mm -hmm. because I can survive here. Yeah. I can't survive on my income in the United States. Mm -hmm. It's totally feasible. So you're impossible. another of the many economic refugees. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah. And at the same time, the beauty of here, as mm -hmm. opposed to Hong Kong, Hong Kong was a highly humid area. Yeah. 96 humidity all year round. Here, you have maybe two months out of the year where it's really hot. Yeah. Uh, it's still not like Florida. Florida is very humid. Mm -hmm. You don't have the same humidity yeah. here. You have two months out of the year where it's our rainy season. You don't know if it's going to be mm -hmm. just raining at night or just raining during the day or both. You don't know. It's like anywhere in the world. Nothing stays the same on a, on a regular yeah. basis. So you only have four months out of the year that are a little, <laughs> eh. Other than that, you're living in God's lake, or <laughs> yeah. I mean, where can you go where you're not, yeah. you don't, ha you're not shoveling snow. You don't have to live with air conditioning. Yeah. Hello, I mean, there isn't very much more. Mm -hmm. And yes, if you do want to work here, you can. Mm -hmm. You can. Ah, um, 
you do need to get certain work permits and things like that. You're still living in a foreign country. But this is your permanent residence now. This is my okay. residence. And so you don't have a, I mean, you're not, I mean, you're a U.S. citizen still? I am a U.S. citizen, yet I will be probably, because here in get Mexico in the last year, they've changed everything again, uh -huh. and it's just the government way. You don't ask questions. It, it just is what it is, sure. okay? So before it was FM2, which is sort of a permanent status, which gives you a little bit extra restrictions on how often you can be out of here. Mm -hmm. Then mm -hmm. there's an FM3, which gives you no real restrictions at all, but um, it gives you a different kind of residency, but you're not a immigrata, which is you're not a Mexican yeah. full residency. And then there was the tourist visa where if you didn't want to get even anything, right. uh, you can come back and forth on a six-month visa. Six months. Now, it's either permanent or if you do take the visa, then you have to leave here for a period of time. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what it is. I have yeah, to find this out. Three days or something. You to, and uh, you then you come back. I don't wish to do that, so I will probably go for my permanent, mm -hmm. and I've been here 13 years. I've been here since 2000. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you, are you fluent in Spanish? Or? I have enough that I can get by. Okay. Uh, it, the help was <laughs> being in Florida and uh, having yeah. a lot of Spanish-speaking people there as well, too. So, um, I'm very familiar with Florida because I went to Florida State University and I did my teaching internship in Fort Lauderdale at okay. Stranahan High School. So I, I know, so you know, you, I know what you you're know talking where about. I was, yeah. <laughs> so uh, so that, you've lived now in Hong Kong and in Mexico and any other countries? Uh, no, but when I lived in Hong Kong, I had a great opportunity to travel to other sure. parts of Asia. And because it was economical at the time, and so you go ahead and you do it, I was fortunate enough to go to England, mm -hmm. Australia, Germany, Brussels, mm -hmm. uh, Switzerland. I, Italy, took the train from Switzerland to Italy, and don't go to, um, <laughs> what is it, uh, what's that romantic, Venice. You Venice. don't go to Venice by yourself. You really don't. It's no. too romantic, but yeah. it was a, a, a not such a nice weekend in uh, Switzerland at the time. And the people I was doing some business with said, why don't you take the train over to <laughs> Italy and come back in a, in a day or two. Yeah. And so I figured, well, everything's closed. Why not? And so I'm on the train. And you do have to remember, though, when, on, when you're on the train, though, you're always going to get stuck somewhere in, in Italy mm -hmm. for some reason. That's why everyone's yeah. got a basket with bread, wine, and cheese. <laughs> and everybody just gets out of the train. It was just a wonderful, wonderful experience. It really was. Really That's one of the great benefits of living overseas is to get that travel opportunity. Well, you, you forget, too, because Europe is so much closer together. You're not yeah. traveling forever. Right. You're, you're really not. It's true. It's easy to get around. So you're single or married now? Or? I am single now. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, what about children? No children, except my okay. four-legged uh -huh. boy. Okay. <laughs> so um, what prompted you, you know, personally, to move abroad? I and mean, it sounds like you had an interesting experience overseas. And I don't know what really prompted me to go to abroad. It, what helped was my husband at the time always wanted to be abroad. Mm -hmm. I was very suburban. I never really traveled much. Yeah. And at, in those days, in, 1970, in the 70s, people were talking about Europe. Nobody spoke about Asia. Yeah. And so the opportunity ar arose mm -hmm. because of my husband. Coming here was because of too many too much crime that was going on in the area that we lived in mm -hmm. and it's still a very family oriented society true the white man comes in and changes things <laughs> our tv commercials our tv it changes things mm -hmm. everybody wants what the united states has only they forget that there's a price for it mm -hmm. not it's that i'm a, saying our point. country isn't good don't get me wrong right. i am right. i am honored and i am proud to be a u.s citizen and I would never give up my citizenship. Mm -hmm. But it's not always that easy 
especially in the last couple of years with the economy the way it is. Yep. Mexico may not be the wealthiest country in the world, but it is the most stable out of economically than most countries in the world right now. Interesting. I didn't realize I, I, that. That's yes. a good point. So, um, what challenges do you think expats face living overseas? Uh, I mean, you would they consider yourself everything. an expat now. Well, right? they do. I, I notice that people still have a tendency to remember where they were before mm -hmm. they come here. Mm -hmm. And so they're expecting everything to be precisely on time. If you were having a delivery from Sears or somewhere, you forget. Even in the States, you're lucky if you would say, is it the morning or the afternoon? Yeah. Here, it's kind of the same yeah. most of the time. But people have a tendency to forget that they're in a foreign country mm -hmm. and they are demanding certain things that is not very respectful because when, you, when I lived in Florida and because we had a very large Cuban population and it is still considered Little Havana, mm -hmm. uh, the last... From 91 onwards, till I moved here, you had to be bilingual in the state of Florida to get a job. I had to speak yeah. Spanish to get a job, and that's my country. Yeah. Okay? Mm. Number two, if you, um, most of the people in the stores were not totally English speaking people. Here, people are trying harder to speak mm -hmm. English. Mm -hmm. uh, Mexicans don't usually like confrontations, but neither does any nationality that you go to that country and you start babbling on in your own language and expecting. Mm -hmm. The only thing I do find is we Americans, because we're the only nation in the world that tips, most other countries have a gratuity that's built into the bill, whether it's a, a something you've eaten, Mm -hmm. at a restaurant mm -hmm. or for a service that is given to you. Here, as I noticed in, Mex in Hong Kong as well, when the Americans came in and it was the toy manufacturers and it was the electronics people and the, the clothing people, people the <laughs> before you knew it, like the brand new Hyatt that opened up and they had these magnificent marble mm -hmm. floors and wall ceiling to floor windows so you saw Hong Kong Island from Kowloon's side. It was magnificent. <laughs> Because we Americans are so used to tipping and we have a very bad habit, we're thinking U.S. dollars. Mm -hmm. We change it wherever we go mm -hmm. and make it a bit difficult. And we have to try and remember to go with how it is for that particular country. Mm -hmm. It's not 10 or 15 percent on the U.S. dollar. Oh, this is cheap. This is that. Yeah. Well, the more you keep saying it, everything keeps rising because, you know, you keep putting it out. Yeah. And that's what starts to happen so that for a lot of us, like anyone who's lived here for 10 years already has seen such an increase mm -hmm. in things. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's still not as expensive as Canada, the United States and other parts mm -hmm. of Europe. Yet, we're starting to catch up here in Mexico. True, cars, electronics are the most costly of mm -hmm. things here mm -hmm. because it's usually brought in. Um, they've even changed the car situation with your status now. You, if you're going to be on a permanent status, you must have Mexican plates before mm -hmm. you can mm -hmm. have whatever origin of country that you came from. And you actually didn't even have to go and get a driver's license that was Mexican. It could be whatever country you're from, sure. as long as you didn't take the car out. It just stayed here. Mm -hmm. A lot of people do that. A lot of people. Yeah. But now they've changed it. I happen to have gotten a car that had Mexican plates <laughs> on it. I didn't want to take any chances. <laughs> you pay a little higher got that on out. the insurance. Yeah. But that's... Why not try and be as legit as possible? Uh -huh. Yeah, well, that makes sense. And Sorry, I, I, I have, don't know. A number of people I've talked to are concerned about that changing, you know. But you see, they the get all deals. nervous and they want answers deal. right now. Still, all in all, the Mexican government is not looking to get rid of mm -hmm. the white man. Mm -hmm. We still bring an income in, sure. we still spend money here. Yes, there are some people who are very, very wealthy that are here, yeah. but they've got a home here, they've got a home somewhere else. This is just a layover, 
okay? Mm -hmm. But there is a lot of us that are here because of it's an economical situation. Sure. And the people here basically are charming. Whenever people here, that's another thing about the United States, please forgive me. I love you all dearly, but you can't believe everything that the papers, that you read in the papers. <laughs> the same thing happened in Hong Kong when uh, the Vietnamese were trying to escape from Vietnam. Yeah. This was in... Seven, I think in the 80s, in the 80s, I think. Mm -hmm. And we were having huge barges of people coming in. Hong Kong is a tiny island mm -hmm. packed with people. <laughs> That's why they build up. There's no yeah. room for anything. Yes, they had to put them sort of in an, in an area because if they start running around and they don't have mm -hmm. the legitimacy of being there, things happen. The same thing with here. Oh, yeah. Americans only listen to what they've been told. And a lot of people still think that Mexico is Tijuana. This is not Tijuana. <laughs> yes, we are a small community, Ayihik mm -hmm. and Chapala. Yet, if there is some problems, it's usually the cartel with the cartel. If somebody gets shot, it's a hit. You know it is because you know mm -hmm. from the way they've mm -hmm. been shot. If they've been decapitated, it's because they... They crossed the people that they were working for. Well, they were in the wrong place at the wrong time. <laughs> okay. And yes, you have to also remember, because it's a small community, mm -hmm. you hear things faster. Mm -hmm. For what happens here is a hundred times more daily in any state in the United States. So you um. have to... Look at the ratio. Put it in perspective. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, a number of people have said that. Some people have expressed concern about what they see as rising crime rates and all the rest of that. And of oh, course, and have, have been shocked by people being capped, you know, kidnapped off the streets and usually held for ransom. If, if, if it's and, Mexican, then that we did have a, a really serious situation last year where mm -hmm. they were only taking young Mexicans and just scooping them off the street. And yeah. I mean, these were children. Okay, these were not adults. So the rumor was that there was a European black market situation that wanted organs. Mm. It's very possible. You're going to tell me it doesn't happen in the States, only you don't hear about it, yeah. only you get to hear. It's been happening in Thailand for years. Exactly. So all I'm just trying to bring out is anywhere you live, mm -hmm. you, you try and be watchful. You try not to put yourself in a situation that could happen even in the United States. Yeah. In Hong Kong, the more people around, the better you were because it was 24-7 every single day. Sure. Didn't matter what day of the week. Here, uh, it's a touristy area. I find even that the expats that come here, a lot of them are running away from their own country mm -hmm. because there's legal issues sure. and they think they're going to hide here. And that's happened too. You don't get to read about that that much in the United States or Canada. You only get no, to hear. It's been a lot of fugitives in Mexico for a long time. Exactly. And yeah. so all I'm just trying to say is you, you have good and bad wherever you go. Mm -hmm. There's a price to pay for wherever you decide to live. Mm -hmm. It just depends on each individual. What is it that you want from your life? So what are the most difficult challenges or issues that you've personally faced uh, living overseas? Not knowing. <laughs> Not knowing. And the tendency is assuming. Mm -hmm. And because of not knowing, you end up sometimes doing things that you're not... You thought it was going to go a certain way because you're, or you're thinking U.S. or yes. you're thinking Canadian. And it doesn't always work that way. <laughs> As I'm sure for the Mexicans that go to the United States, it's not the same way either. Um, each year, things change here. Before, I think the hardest part was there was no real recourse if something catastrophic did kind of happen. Mm -hmm. uh, whether it was a medical issue, whether it was your house exploded, I mean, insurance and things like that here were not very stable. Mm -hmm. And if you did get something, it would have to be either represented from your own country or uh, not necessarily from here. But all of that is changing. There's far more security mm -hmm. here in many ways than 
what we had before. No, it's not like the United States. No, it's not like Canada yet. I had an issue with a dentist here uh, just last year, and it was just the wrong two people together, let's mm -hmm. put it that mm -hmm. way, and I was really messed up. There, I found out through the Mexicans that there's a brand, there's an organization in Guadalajara called Camihel, C-A-M-J-A-L-E, Camihel, or E-L, E-L. <laughs> and they are an arbitra uh, uh, arbitration commission for medical. Uh -huh. And the dentist was not prepared to give me any money back. She wanted to redo everything, and I'm terrified to sit in her chair. I don't want sure. her to redo. And they helped me get at least two-thirds of my money back. Oh, that's good. And yeah. I'm, a, I'm not a Mexican. I'm not a Mexican yeah, citizen. they protected you. They did the best they could mm -hmm. for the circumstances. Yeah. And it was better than nothing. Yes, it can be a little exhausting. You may have to go back ten times because there's always a paper that you seem to be missing. <laughs> of course. But there was something there and it did help. I also have the... Um, IMSS, which is the socialized medicine for here in Mexico. Mm -hmm. uh, I pay, depending on your ear, uh, your age, I pay um, just under four hundred for the year, hmm. and I'm covered. Well, good. Covered. I can't tell you exactly how covered because again. Each year that changes. But golf a bit, sure. you're in a car accident or something, you carry your card on you, they will take you straight there. And mm -hmm. there are very fine hospitals here that are going to cost you six arms and eight legs. If you're, if it's your time, <laughs> it's your time, whether you're in the finest hospital or in yeah. uh, a true. government hospital. Sure. Please excuse me, I got out. Oh, yeah, sure. So, um... What do you think are the best things about living in another country? Well, Mexico primarily. I can't say it about other places I've been in, but the weather here, you can't beat it. Okay. And this particular area is considered God's Little Acre. That's, that's yeah. Um, in in uh, Guadalajara and Mexico City, it is toxic, it is hot. And it makes a big difference. We have the beautiful lake here. Sure. The weather is brilliant. Sounds uh, like the health care is pretty good. The health care is fair. Mm -hmm. Fair. And I'll tell you, for all the years we were in Florida and my mother had HMO, <laughs> they nearly killed her off also. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, you have to weigh things out. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of doctors here that speak fluent English. Yes, the prices mm -hmm. are less. The thing is, is that, as I said before, I can survive here financially. Mm -hmm. I could not mm -hmm. in the United States. Did you buy your house here? Yes. Uh, we bought when we first came. We had a budget, and we were going to go past mm -hmm. it. So when we went to the realtors, we said, this is what we're going to spend. Don't show us anything else because you're tempted, mm -hmm. and we're not going to. Unfortunately, we needed a uh, an adult community in which we thought the realtors were being honest with us. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that's not what it was. Mm -hmm. um, I had needed to get out of that place because it was people coming up on the weekends from Guadalajara and doing a fiesta from uh. Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So the thing that you need to know is if you decide to buy you not only go with a realtor, but then you get there by taxi or something at different times of the day for mm -hmm. the next three, four days or a week on your own without the realtor. That's the only way you're going to find out mm -hmm. whether it's a quiet area, not such a quiet area. It, you do need to check things out here because you can't go that, by... And that would be a recommendation for expats coming down coming to every couple of weeks or... Yeah. A month or something. And don't just go and get something. It, yeah. You know, everybody wants to go into Ihihit because it's very accessible for walking <laughs> everywhere. But what people don't realize is how noisy it is there. Uh -huh. It is extremely noisy, can be, especially during the fiestas, and there's mm -hmm. always coming in. They, I don't know where they find them. I think it's <laughs> wonderful. It's part of their religion. Some of them are just beautiful services and, and, and uh, fiestas that they have. But 
there's cannons that are being shot off. There's fie- there's loud yeah. noise. Mariachi music. And, <laughs> it, and it can go straight. It could be four days straight uh-huh. without you even realizing. Well. So these are the only things you have to be very watchful for. Your best bet is to come, be in a certain area for two to three weeks at a time. Mm-hmm. Check it out, go walking around, take a taxi there, sometimes late at night. You don't know if your next door neighbor is a partying person that parties all day, all night. Sure. You just don't know, and neither does really the realtor. Mm-hmm. And they now have a, 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 a gentleman who, who will inspect. He's an inspector, where you can also have your house inspected, which is a very, very important thing mm-hmm. to do. It's home inspections. He happens to be a Canadian. So uh, it's hmm. well worth the investment. It's well worth the investment yeah. because you just don't know. But what do you think is a, like an adequate uh, budget to live on here a month? Everybody's a bit different. Okay, for instance, before I can answer that, we have a supermarket here called Superlake. He's got everything from the United States and Canada that you can think of. Mm-hmm. Six times the amount than even the United States. And yeah. the store is packed. He has things that you cannot <laughs> get anywhere else. If it's a brand that you want, right, if it's right, a right. label that you want, if it's crunchy peanut butter that you wanted, yeah. okay? But you're paying a high price, mm-hmm. okay? We do have Walmart here that is more reasonable. And we also have the Mexican ones that are what they call the misutiadors. And you have a lot of small tiendas that do sell fresh fruit mm-hmm. and vegetables. And depending on each individual, what is your lifestyle? If you have a lower income to yeah. survive on, you can. That's the beauty. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If you have a little bit higher, you can spend it. <laughs> you can. They'll take your money here. Yeah. So, so you think? Uh, I mean, someone who fifteen hundred dollars a month or so could say that again. Fifteen hundred. Yeah. Could they, yes. Could they Very nice. Relatively comfortably here. Very nicely okay. on fifteen hundred. Mm-hmm. If that's even just one person. Mm-hmm. Uh, when my mom and I first came, she was getting a social security for my dad who had passed mm-hmm. about twelve hundred, and the two of us. And we're talking 13 years ago. The two of us could survive on that Uh without going into too much of our own savings Mm -hmm. that we came down with. So, Um, I'm I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay. What's also very important is before people come here, what they also don't know is there's a strand of typhoid here. Okay, that's not like anywhere else in the world. Mm. It is very common. You can get injections before you come here from the United States and um, what's the other one? Um, Hepatitis A and B. Mm -hmm. Primarily, because we're in a very tropical type climate, this typhoid is a form of typhoid that never leaves the body. Mm -hmm. Depending on the degree, within the first three months we were here, my mother got typhoid. Mm -hmm. She was in a coma for about six months. Okay, it can happen. From the water? Uh, she, I think she got it from, from, a, um, from shrimp that wasn't fully cooked. Okay. okay, even Mexicans are loaded with this typhoid mm-hmm. because there are different mm-hmm. parts of the area where it's even more beach like, like Cancun's and things like that, and Puerto Vallarta, where even the eggs, if they're not well cooked, mm-hmm. you have to be careful, especially during the summer months because of refrigeration. Mm-hmm. You try to stay away from anything that has mayo in it, unless it's a restaurant that is an enclosed area. Yeah. Eating off the streets is not bad. I have done it myself, and I've been very fortunate. The only time I got food poisoning was when I was in Hong Kong, bought from the supermarket, and the beef was not good. I gave myself food poisoning, mm-hmm. okay? It wasn't from being out on the street. The street food is usually very fresh. Mm-hmm. But again, you have to know enough Mexicans to know which is the right one to go to and which isn't. Mm-hmm. But the typhoid, you can get injections. We didn't know about it at the time before we came. And there, it's just something to remember before you even come mm-hmm. here. Also, you before you come here, what's also important is check with your Vantage. 
because you can get everything all organized in the United States or Canada before you come here because if you come here it's going to cost more. If you keep a family member's address for the United States or Canada wherever you're coming from it will also be an advantage for whatever TV you want to hook up for all sorts of telephone situations it's easier to do it that way than if you allow them to give you a Texas or a, a, a US or Canadian number mm -hmm. primarily because um, they're charging you for a service mm -hmm. so these are extra things that so one can look into. Do you mean like if you have Sonic or something like that or Verizon or you can transfer that number? Talk with your people in the yeah. before you come here mm -hmm. because they do have international setups yeah. and I do know that a lot of people here are using uh, Vantage and they're able to still online pay um, yeah. and keeping one US account is also preferable. Mm -hmm. Here also the banks are different. We have financial centers and we have banks. The financial centers will give you a little bit higher percent on your money mm -hmm. um, and you can go into the setes which are non-risk situations. If the sete fluctuates in uh, the percentage that you will be getting, that's the only thing that you would mm -hmm. be fluctuating mm -hmm. on. But you're getting more than the banks here. Uh -huh. Yeah. And what, what do they pay? You, you know uh, it you? varies depending on the amount that goes in, but okay. you can get as high as 5%, uh, okay, and without having a risk. Mm -hmm. Okay. That, that sounds pretty good compared to what's going on. Out there in but even the banks here are only doing one, maybe not even 2%. Uh -huh. Maybe just one if, you're, if you'll get that. Uh, okay, another question I wanted to ask you is that you had. Uh, from your living experience and a lot of preparation and kind of orientation to living in another country. What would you recommend for Americans who are considering, or, or any national, like Canadians, Americans, but uh, you know, people moving to another country, what would you recommend that they do in preparation? Well, first, look up as much as you possibly can. If you know anybody, you can, uh, like for, for Mexico here, in this particular area, there's, uh, it's called, um, wait a second, uh, chapala.com, C-H-A-P-A-L-A.com. And it will give you a lot of information because we also have the Lake Chapala Society, which is an American organization that gives you a lot of information. Whenever you go to a country, see what you can find that's an American organization and you go to it. Ask them, pick their brains like you've never picked anybody's brains. You don't just go somewhere without kind of looking into it a little bit because the thing that some people don't like here is that there are things to do, but it depends on who you are and what you like in your lifestyle. If you like playing cards, if you like going, you eat, most people eat out here breakfast and lunch most of the time because it's so reasonable what it'll cost you to buy your food and cook it. It's going to cost you the same. They, we do have two gambling casinos now, which we didn't have before. Uh, but it's a repetitive situation. Nothing changes that dramatically. We have our four basic little places that you can go d dining and dancing, and they don't really change. So it's the same people over and over again. You have to know what you're prepared to, to uh, accept. There are some people I know that are going to the Philippines. You couldn't get me, you couldn't pay me to go and live in the Philippines. Yes, it's going to be one third of what you're paying here. I can't take the tsunamis, I can't take the heat, and I can't take the flooding. Mm -hmm. So you have to sort of look, people are going to Panama. If you can take the heat, go to Panama. I think that in Nicaragua, mm -hmm. it, they're all much cheaper than here. But again, there's a price for everything. What is it that you can deal with? I can deal with the fact that I don't have to live with air conditioning. Lived with air conditioning in Hong Kong, lived with air conditioning in Florida. I don't have to live with air conditioning here. So, um, I think you just need to know what can you live with, what do you want to look for, and ask, pick the brains of whoever you are around, go into real estate companies, talk with them, 
see if they will give you some extra information if that's feasibly possible and just do your homework check the banks or the financial centers when you come here look in our we have the ojo de lago which is a monthly magazine newspaper everybody advertises in it you will find from real estate to what pharmacy to a doctor to yeah, it's in there. okay mm -hmm. and then we have the lake chapala review which is uh once every two weeks or something like that mm -hmm. i don't know mm -hmm. um and then there's the guadalajara reporter which also is a very good little newspaper. And these are your three basic English uh, bits of information. Whenever you go to a foreign country, get as much information, get their newspapers. If you can't read it, go back to your hotel and ask the concierge to translate as much as he possibly can, or you'll find a translator in the United States it's when you come back. Learning the language or making an effort to learn the language. Okay, here it's not essential. It really is not essential. When I first came, yes, nobody spoke English. Nobody. Now, it's 13 years later. You can, it couldn't hurt to know a couple of basic things. Even if you feel like you can't grasp the language, that's okay. Depending on your age, depending on a lot of different things, sometimes it's the memory. Some people just are able to and some people are not. But you don't absolutely have to have it here. You don't. Yet, it is very nice and people are very gracious when you try to use whatever you possibly can. So it's cultural courtesy in a very, way to yes, learn as is. much of the language as you can. Exactly. Okay. So, Wendy, I, first of all, I want to thank you very much for sharing your My stories. My pleasure. And, uh, and I'd like to ask you finally if there's anything else that you'd like to comment on related to the experience of living abroad or advice or recommendations. Anyone who's have. not sure about coming to Chapala, Jalisco, or Ajijic, don't worry. We don't care if you don't come. <laughs> <laughs> the place is getting overly populated. That's, that's a cool, that's a good <laughs> uh, Overly populated uh, with so many people coming here that have heard yeah. either from a friend or it's all over the websites now, yeah. this whole area. So our little secret is no longer a secret. <laughs> and so you're welcomed if you decide to come. Make it your home. Don't make it a foreign country. Make it, treat everybody here as though how you yourself would like to be treated. And you'd be surprised how respectful people will be. There's good and bad wherever you go. You can find it if you're negative, and if you're positive, you will find the good too. Oh, that's great. Good advice. I just came back, uh, well, in October, I went and did a series of interviews in Cuenca, Ecuador, uh, and it was very interesting. You know, same kind of, a lot of the same kind of stuff economic, but the population there has grown from 300 expatriates four years ago to now over 4,000. Our expatriates here, which we're not called expats. When I lived in Hong Kong and you okay. live in Asia and Europe, you're considered an expat. Right. In Mexico and Asia, you're a gringo. gringo yeah. <laughs> or a gringa. <laughs> and that was from 100 years ago when the United States was uh, occupying sure. parts. And it was gringo. We wore green <laughs> camouflage, so it was gringo. Oh, that's how we got the name that's, gringo. Oh, that's interesting. So yeah. um, the thing is, is... Um, I'm sorry, I just lost my trend of thought. Oh, it's okay. We were talking about the gringo and the name. Oh, okay. Uh, we're not expats, but here, you don't really... There are times I could be in Ayihik or Chapala. Well, more Ayihik. Because there's such a large gringo population, there are times you can walk out the door and you don't see a Mexican and you'd swear you're yeah. in a small little <laughs> community in, in the United States. Yet... Because of the economic problems, there are a lot of gringos who did go back to the United States and Canada because they were mm -hmm. fearful. Mm -hmm. To go back to the States and think that's how you're going to better watch your money is wrong. Yeah. There's nothing you can do whether you're here or whether you're there. <laughs> so it's your choice what you want to do. Yeah. That's what it boils down to. Okay, well, thank you very much, Wendy. That's